part of the symbiotic relationship between patriotism and process. Because of the Trojan who, having uh, rather scored his own monopoly over the resources in South Africa, is a great advance of British civilization and is a great contribution to British patriotism, who then paused in that analysis of what it was that he had done in South Africa and remarked, but of course, Pure patriotism is very commendable, but patriotism plus 50% is much better. We <laughs> really have to understand that we are not greatly surprised that the great patriotic crusade of 1914 proved to be a tremendous bonanza economically for the capitalists of the belligerent countries. Nor are we very surprised that what was called total economic mobilization became synonymous not with the equal sacrifices of various sectors of the national societies, but became synonymous with the acceleration of capitalist concentration. Nor are we very surprised that the great giants of monopoly capitalism came out of the First World War richer and more pugnacious than ever, more capable, after all, of standing up to the resistance of the working classes, like that great octopus of industry in Italy called Ansaldo, that Ansaldo of which uh, of which Gramsci was to write once that it was a monster with a thousand gullets, which came out of the war an absolute monster of industrial strength and power, and whose owners, the Peroni brothers, were so rich and so powerful and ultimately so arrogant that they breathed the way to power of Mussolini, thinking that fascism was the very best way, after all, of coping with the social threat. None of that surprises us. Nor should it greatly surprise us, as a matter of fact, that the governments of the belligerent countries, who after all exacted a tremendous toll of sacrifice from the popular classes, and who, uh, who pursued the, the anti-patriots, or who pursued the anti-war militants with a tremendous ferocity, that they never did oversee or monitor those exorbitant profits that were being raked in by capitalists in the name of national defense, but on the contrary, Rather than monitoring or overseering, they contributed to those profits with those kinds of very lax contracts, with those kinds of very lax uh, subsidies uh, that were granted in the name of national defense. But what really causes us to stop and pause, what really causes us to reflect, and what is so important, is the complicity, if you please, of the working class organizations in the process of that concentration of capital in the course of the First World War. Because you put your finger on the, uh, on the sacred union and you come to understand really what the full implications of that sacred union are really about when you realize that they were the social patriots. In other words, those reformist, trade unionists, and socialist leaders who supported the war right up to the hill. That they were those social patriots who formed in the course of the war a very benign and very pathetic alliance with the capitalists. Capitalists who hated them, who despised them, who didn't want to collaborate with them, and who collaborated only when it was in their own interest, and who yielded up nothing that was of interest to the working classes, and who ultimately would be perfectly capable of pulling in fascist thugs to destroy those particular organizations. And so you are in the face of something extremely important. Because, you see, it was those social patriots who were the great guardians of social peace in the course of the First World War. They were the ones who held the workers in line. And in the process of doing that, they contributed to that expansion of monopoly capitalism, which, though it didn't absolutely foreclose the revolutionary option in 1918 and 19, at least very drastically narrowed its chances for success. And it was no accident, and it was no temporary aberration that the reformists acted that way. It was a calculated and a deliberate policy. For they operated on the premise that by bartering their loyalty to the war and the war effort for that kind of bargaining privilege that they might get, they reasoned that if they managed, after all, to integrate their organizations into the national community permanently, 
They reason that if it were finally possible to modulate the power, the arbitrary power of capitalism and to establish the rights of the workers, they would have accomplished something very realistic. And consequently, it was on that premise that they operated. And in all of the sacred union, whether in Germany or in France, you then find that process in which those social patriots really oppose strikes, in which they mute all kinds of upset from below, all kinds of mass action from below, and in which they stand hat in hand, waiting for the small change of class collaboration. You see, they were, in the purest sense of the word, opportunists because they had long since given up the idea of revolution as being really a pipe dream. And having given up that idea, they were hell-bent on joining a system they couldn't beat. And yet they weren't very realistic, because in more instances than not, with this social patriotism and with this class collaboration, ultra-realism turned out to be self-delusion. And they certainly, in a sense, were not very helpful to the working classes because the pretension that they would establish the rights of the workers turned out in more instances than not to be a betrayal of those rights. You see that in holding out for bargaining privileges within the system, they devitalize their organizations, strip them of their independence, strip them of their militancy. And in waiting for social reforms, they played the game of co-optation by which the establishment was barring the route to revolution. And in saying, after all, that the class collaboration that they wanted would bring great gains, they underestimated the fact that it takes two to collaborate and that the capitalists really didn't want to collaborate only at that moment when it was in their own extreme self-interest at the very end of the war. You see what the final analysis of all of that is. That by giving up and by destroying what was the historic function of the working class movement, by putting roadblocks in the way of Lenin's schema and working day and night to do that, what they did, those social patriots, those right reformist socialists, those trade union leaders, was after all to collect a handful of very small and mainly counterfeit coins. <coughs> And do we have to document that? Of course we do. Because it is an history that echoes through the decades and right down into our own time. We are talking about the great embrace of Gompers and Woodrow Wilson. We are talking of the embrace of Meany and Nixon. We are talking of all of those modalities of collaboration, which after all have done something very drastic to what the purposes presumably of the struggle of working men and women was from the time that it was conceived in the earliest industrial moment. And so we ask what happened to those social patriots in Germany in the course of the First World War. And their behavior, after all, is a very extended experience in futility and self-delusion. Look, that they rushed into that sacred union, the Board Frieda in Germany, by biting at the bait that the government held out to them. They bit at that bait and they fell into the net of co-optation. Because Bateman Holbeck, after all, insinuated that there would be reforms, reforms that would be valuable for the working classes. In those last days of July of 1914 and the early days of August, there were constant confabulations between Bateman Holbeck and Sudikum, who was acting chief of the Social Democratic Party. And questions and answers went back and forth. And Bateman Holbeck said, certainly, if you are loyal to the war effort, you social Democrats, that we will not repress your party and we will not repress your press. You will have your newspapers and you will have your party. But more than that, yes, if you are properly domesticated within the framework of German society, then you will find that we will act on those long overdue programs that are of interest to you. They von Hohenbeck talked after all about necessary actions that the government would take. He didn't spell them out. He didn't say that it would be universal suffrage or collective bargaining, but he insinuated 
And we know why he did, because he spelled it out in a secret memorandum. What May von Holtvig was doing was co-opting, and he was very clear about it. That after all, if the workers had gone off to the war on the 4th of August of 1914, they had wedded the nation, but they still had to wed the state, by which May von Holtvig meant the system. And in order to do that, they had to have the illusion that the social democratic movement would count for something and that it could produce reforms. And here is Meg von Holtvig stating it very bluntly in his secret memorandum of, the, of, of October 27th of 1914. The workers who return home as soldiers will still be workers. The state shouldn't give them the impression of being the enemy of unions and the Socialist Party but should use those organizations to isolate degenerate radicals and prevent them from leading the workers astray. And don't think that the Social Democrats were calm by that. They knew it was co-optation, they accepted it, and they accepted it enthusiastically. Because I tell you that these are reformists who have no interest in those kinds of revolutions that one thinks of classically to bring socialism. They are reformists, pure and simple. And consequently, they are perfectly able to accommodate themselves to the entire institutional structure of a monarchical Germany. And you have that in an astonishing interchange that goes on between the right wing's FKD deputy Max Kohn and the Under Secretary of State Von Schaffer in October of 1914. And Von Schaffer said, well, will you accept the kinds of institutions we have? And Max Kohn says, of course, we want a lasting alliance with the state. And then he goes on to say this astonishing thing, if our relationship proves fruitful, you can count on the orientation of the Social Democratic Party in a monarchical direction that it will buy the monarchy. But there was one quid pro quo. The Social Democrats knew that they were being conned into the system. But the quid pro quo was that the government had to come through on the reforms. That after all, the workers were filled full of all of that Republican and revolutionary propaganda of past decades. And they would want certain kinds of proofs that in this system it was possible for them to exist and in this sense, the government disappointed the right-wing social democrats, disappointed the social patriots, because they were not forthcoming with those reforms, at least not for quite a long while. And Bateman Holweg put it very bluntly in another memorandum in November 1914. He wanted this SPD on its knees. Reforms can be made until the social democratic leaders clearly understand that the German Empire and the Prussian state can never shape the firm basis on which they have grown. That very system which the Social Democrats have previously branded as militarism, you see the point, if the Social Democrats say they buy militarism and what it stands for, then yes, there will be some of those great reforms. Not very helpful. And it still poses the problem, after all, for the class collaborators, for the corporatists. It poses the problem of the industrialists themselves. Suppose the industrialists don't want to collaborate. They're a very tough breed in Germany. Suppose they don't want to yield up a penny of their excess profits in the war. And suppose they think of the war, after all, as a great way of militarizing labor, of establishing a very draconian military regime inside the factories. Then what chance do the corporatists have? I ah, guess they have a second line of defense these social democrats and these trade unionists who have gone into the sacred union, a second line of defense even stronger than the civilian government itself, they have an ally, an ally that will mediate between them and the capitalists, that will force this collaboration, the ally, the officer corps. Now you are in a never, never land because there is an imperialist war going on, and there are men dying in it, and there are men and women who can't cut that inflation on the home front, 
And there is already the destruction of what has been an historic function of the social democratic movement and the ally for the working class in the minds of the social democratic and trade union chiefs comes out to be the military general staff and the high <coughs> command. The reasoning goes something like this that after all, the military has distanced itself from the haute bourgeoisie, that it has distanced itself from the social class and from the values of the capitalists, that after all, it represents a pre-capitalist society. It represents basically the landed aristocracy or the landed aristocratic values of Germany, of which are paternalistic, of which are anti-market, of which think in terms of Gemeinschaft, of an entire national community in which everyone should have his place, but everyone should have his part, and everyone should have his reward. And these military people, according to the social democrat reformists, had looked at the workers going off to war and had said they should be rewarded and at the expense of some of these excess profits of the capitalists, and consequently they had an ideology that really conformed to that role of mediator uh, between capital and labor, and in addition to that, uh, they had power. Uh, because the law of siege had gone into effect on the day of mobilization, and the law of siege gave tremendous economic and social discretionary powers uh, to the military high command, and they could bring, after all, these industrialists to their knees. Uh, they could force them to collaborate. That was the premise, and that was the reasoning. Now let's not deal with that kind of moral question of whether it's a good idea to save the working classes or with the aid of the military high command. But let's ask the question of whether this was a legitimate premise anyway and whether it operated on the basis of any evidence. Yes, there is clear evidence that there is clash between the military chiefs and the industrialists and the great capitalists in the course of the war in Germany uh, between 1914 and 18. Uh, you find it very clearly, for example, in the relationship between the war ministry and the industrialists. Uh, the war ministry was dominated uh, by military men, and that war ministry had very broad power over production uh, for war. And consequently, uh, they tried to establish in 1915 and again in 1916 uh, what were called war boards, uh, which are arbitration committees, really, uh, in various of the industrial centers uh, to create war boards uh, which should adjudicate various differences. And in the memorandum that went out from the War Ministry on the 10th of February of 1916, it was very specifically underscored uh, that the unions uh, should be the representatives of the workers in these particular war boards. In other words, it presupposed not only the existence, uh, but the participation and the strength of these unions, and you know that that raised hell with the industrialists. You're talking about very tough birds. You're talking about that Central Association of German Iron and Steel Industrialists, who for 30 years had fought every social measure, uh, like Social Security, uh, like medical care and so forth, in which there might be a participation uh, by a union or by worker representatives in the internal affairs of the factory. And here they saw these war boards, as that Central Association was to say in its blast against it, they saw as an effort to bring the parliamentary system into the factory. And they fought it tooth and nail, and they scuttled the program. And nonetheless, you see, the Social Democrats got up in the Reichstag in 1916, and again in earlier 1915, to praise the war ministry over and again in the most extravagant terms. And so you get Gustav Bauer, for example, who is the vice chairman of the Central Association of German Trade Unions and is a right-wing socialist deputy in the Reichstag, who says on the 26th of August of 1915 in the German Reichstag to the great applause of the socialists that the war ministry is the best friend that the German workers have. Poor proletariat. <laughs> A bizarre drama, isn't it? A bizarre drama, this idea, you see, of a mediation by the art between capital and labor and in the interest of labor. And yet there was a central actor.
factor in that strange and bizarre drama. And much of it centers around him, and that is General Bremner. And General Bremner was, after all, the, the general who most appealed to the socialists. He was their general, the democratic general, they sometimes called him. Even in their moments of complete inebriation, the socialist general. And it is this General Clarner, after all, who becomes the head of the so-called War Office, which is a mammoth organization created in 1916, really to dominate over the entire war production problem, uh, to dominate over the entire total economic mobilization. And consequently, Clarner is in an extremely important position. And he's the same General Clarner who will appear on the 27th of October, of 1918, noted well, because when he appears, he appears as the replacement for General Ludendorff, who had been the military dictator and the military commandant uh, for two years since 1916, and here comes Gerner on the 28th of October of 1918, because uh, the jig is up, uh, because the monarchy is finished in Germany, uh, because there is a revolution on the horizon, and when he arrives on the scene, uh, to replace Ludendorff. He is greeted by Fritz Ebert, uh, who is the head of the German Social Democratic Party, and greeted as a great and long-standing friend of the working classes in Germany. And so much did they embrace that they actually made an accord, uh, the famous Werner Ebert Accord, which is fundamental to your understanding of the whole history of the German Revolution. Uh, because that accord, after all, will be one in which Werner brings the army in to the Republic, in which he says the army will support the Republic that is being founded now in 1918, in return for which Abrams says that the Republic will support the army, which means that the army will be there and will be used in order to keep order, or to put it in very concrete terms, it is there to write the death sentence for an authentic social revolution, to write the death warrants for Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Vita. And that is Brunner. But he was no Democrat and he was no socialist. He was a conservative general, but a very shrewd one. And who believed, after all, that there were certain rights that workers had. And who believed that if they were cut too deeply by inflation and the profits of capitalists soared too much, that you would get a disequilibrium, a decomposition in Germany that would very, be very dangerous. And in that sense, he is a bona fide corporatist. He is somebody who believes in that kind of class collaboration. And what Werner tried to do when he was in that war office and headed it, he failed to do, but ultimately was done at the end of the war period. And what was done in terms of that corporate formulation becomes the very foundation of the Weimar Republic and really seals the fate of that republic. Because what Werner wanted to do was to create two kinds of alliances which should be the very prop and the very foundation of a corporatist society or of some kind of combined shop. In other words, an alliance between the trade unions and the industrialists on the one hand, so that they should bargain over the industrial rewards, and an alliance between uh, the Social Democratic Party and the army. He failed to do that as head of the war office. The industrialists certainly wouldn't collaborate in that, but ultimately that was done. And that is the foundation of the Weimar Republic. And it is that foundation upon which all of that bizarre history actually will be mounted. But it suffices to say that in Brunner you have a case in point, that the man is capable of flaying the exorbitant profits, for example, uh, that the industrialists are making. He is perfectly capable of being sympathetic to workers. Uh, for example, in a letter that he writes uh, to an industrialist on the 21st of June of 1917, uh, when this industrialist complains very bitterly that the workers are demanding so much money, and Brunner writes back this. I would observe that industry has gone chasing after war profits in an unheard of manner. 
I wonder, I wonder whether you know that one German employer permits four women who work for him to sleep in a barracks in one bed that is full of lights, and that another employer steals workers from a colleague by offering them higher wages and then considers himself entitled to indemnification by drastically raising the prices he charges to the state. Well, there is a sensitivity, obviously, in a letter of that kind. It raises, in my mind, a parenthetical question, which is, why, if four women are sleeping in one life-stricken bed, there is negotiation by the socialists with generals instead of being out in the street demanding that the society account for atrocities of that kind. But within the framework of Graner's own ideology, it was a kind of sympathy, it was a kind of corporatism, and ultimately, he was very much under the influence of his chief advisor on economic affairs, who was a Captain Richard Merton. And Captain Merton, who was himself the son of a Frankfurt industrialist, was a thoroughgoing corporatist and did something rather extraordinary, which is that by July of 1917, when it became very apparent uh, that both the combination of inflation and exorbitant profits were rocking the boat in Germany, uh, that there was really a strike movement, that there was disaggregation, Merton drew up a memorandum which plays an important part in the whole failure, ultimately, of this corporatism during the war, uh, because Merton draws up a so-called memorandum on the intervention of the state to fix profits and prices. And that memorandum is adopted by Werner and becomes really his own policy statement. Because what Merton says is, what the capitalists are doing is beyond any kind of comprehension. Uh, for example, uh, they're striking contracts uh, with the procurement agencies in which they're not even assigning or fixing the prices of their products until they deliver them so they can charge whatever they please. And in this memorandum were three very concrete proposals, which were corporatist proposals. One, that the War Office had to set prices in advance for all goods delivered. Secondly, that if goods were delivered not at that price, then the factories of those particular industrialists could be sequestrated by the Chancellor under a legal provision. And third, that there should be a very tough excess profits law in order to take some of these exorbitant profits away from the industrialists. And it is with that particular framework that Werner tried, after all, to do what the Social Democrat and Trade Union reformists thought ought to be done to bring some kind of Gemeinschaft or some kind of collective bargaining into the German situation. But it was a myth because the army couldn't and didn't regulate affairs. The army couldn't and didn't discipline the industrialists. In part, of course, because there is no common ideological front in the army. And there are military men who are extremely close to the industrialists. One thinks, for example, of Colonel Max Bauer, who was the close, very close confidant of General Ludendorff, and that Max Bauer, who was really a terrific anti-feminist, an anti-Semite, a reactionary of the First Order, a Nazi before the word. And consequently, uh, this Bauer, after all, was very closely associated and very intimate uh, with some of the great heavy industrial producers of Germany. And consequently, you get no such common front. But it's something more than that, which is that the industrialists are not weak. They have tremendous clout, and it is very difficult to regulate them. And consequently, when Werner, for example, talks about Arbeitsgemeinschaft, when he talks about the so-called social partnership, he gets very hostile answers from the industrialists. And so you get an answer in the chief uh, journal, the chief newspaper, for example, uh, of the uh, metal workers trade, in which we read this. We understand a social, part, a social partnership to be a partnership for work, one that, does not uh, one that does not conceal behind it the impossible principles of general equality and the rule of the many, but which puts everyone in his place, one to lead, the others to follow, all for the general good. Well, obviously, people like this were not going to bargain. And consequently, when Brenner started talking about his American memorandum, and saying that that was his platform, well, what happened was obvious. 
What happened was a kind of conspiracy to replace him and remove him, and it was successful. It was Carl Kriesberg of I.G. Harbin who organized a heavy pressure against Werner, got to Ludendorff, who dismissed him on the 19th of August of 1917 as the head of the war office. After that, any kind of attack that the army makes upon the province of capitalists are the attacks of a paper tiger. Uh, they really have no impact whatsoever. And you have a very classic example and a very good example of that. Uh, that happens in February of 1918. Now remember that the month before, we'll return to that because it's extremely important, that the month before, in January, there have been massive strikes, and especially in Berlin. On the 28th of January, there were a half million workers out on the street shouting for peace, and the army was exemplary in its immediate action. It moved in against that strike with tremendous vigor and sent literally hundreds and hundreds of those strikers immediately into the army, conscripting them, removing them uh, from their uh, deferments for war work. And consequently, the army could work with this back, but not against the industrialists. Because in February, exploded the so-called Daimler case. And Daimler, which is a name you may know if you're interested in automobiles, Daimler, after all, was a Stuttgart automobile manufacturer who was doing a lot of war work. And he was perfectly notorious. Uh, the exorbitant profits that Daimler was making really had become a public scandal. But always, he was apologized for uh, by the war office and by the government on the grounds that he was doing very patriotic work. Then, at the end of 1917, he asked for such an exorbitant price increase in the goods that he was delivering that the war office said, now wait a minute, that's a big <coughs> extravagant, and what we want to do is come into your plant and examine your books. We want, after all, to look at your cost calculations. And Daimler, having all of that kind of democratic spirit of the German industrialist, said nobody comes and looks at my books. And consequently, uh, quite obviously, he was going to repost, and he did on the 12th of February by saying, now I go on strike, no more night work or overtime work, which I don't make any money on, I eliminate that. That's how far his patriotism went. At that point, uh, the war office decided that it must, after all, militarize his plan. It must take his plan over because he's going on strike against the war effort itself. But with a sudden flash of legalism, they say they must go to the parliament and get a law that enables them to do that. Now, they didn't need a law of when they were drafting men into the army in the January strikes in Berlin. But they went to the Bundesrat and asked for such a law, and there it died. There simply was no disciplining of the industrial. So, it raises the question, what were these games? of social corporatism. What were the gains of the war freedom for the social democratic and trade union reformists and for the working classes? A very, very slender harvest. Two laws that you can call desirable laws from the point of view of the working class movement. The so-called Imperial Association Law of 1939 was removed. Now, the Imperial Association Law was a discriminatory law against trade unions in Germany. Uh, by that law of 1909, trade unions were assimilated to political parties, uh, which meant uh, that you had to submit the membership list, the list of the members, to the police. And the police, of course, made them available to employers who would dismiss very frequently uh, those of their workers who had joined unions. And furthermore, since it was assimilated to a political organization, no young person under 18 could belong to a union, because no young person under 18 could belong to a political party or attend political meetings. And consequently, with a lot of young people coming into the workforce, it meant that the unions couldn't conscript them into unionization, couldn't recruit them, unless this law was changed. Now, Beethoven Hohenbeck and the government didn't want to change this law, but once again, you see, you get this kind of collaboration only at moments of duress and for practical reasons. Beethoven Hohenbeck talks to the Prussian cabinet in December of 1915 and says that maybe that law ought to be repealed because there is a real movement of opposition that's beginning to develop in the Social Democratic Party. 
Uh, some of the centrists are moving off to the left. They're saying that too much, after all, has been sacrificed to chauvinism. Too much of the program has been abandoned. Eivon Olbeck says to the Prussian cabinet, as a result of the long duration of the war, the attitude of the radical wing of the Social Democratic Party becomes even harsher. If they fight the reformists by reproaching them for being pacified by the pretty words of the government. It will hardly be possible to keep those moderates on the right track without throwing them some relief. And the relief that was thrown to them was the repeal in June of 1916 of the Imperial Association Law so that trade unions now did not have to submit their list to the police so that they could recruit workers who were under 18 years of age, which gave them a certain kind of flexibility. But the centerpiece of this corporatist ideal was inscribed, presumably, in what was called the Auxiliary Service Law of, of December of 1916. And the Auxiliary Service Law had been a law desired, actually, by the industrialists. It was a law to make conscriptable everybody in Germany between the ages of 16 to 60 who was not in the army, conscriptable either for agricultural or for industrial work. In other words, to put the entire German population, as it were, at the disposal of those who needed employees, who needed a labor force. The industrialists wanted that very badly. They also wanted a uh, provision of that it was impossible for workers to move uh, from their particular plant to look for work in another plant where the wages might be higher. And both of those provisions were, in fact, inscribed in the Auxiliary Service Law. But it was such a great favor to the industrialists that the War Office did bargain with the trade unions, bargained with the end of the trade unions, and put in an article, which was Article 9. And Article 9 institutionalizes the trade unions within a bargaining situation. Uh, because Article 9 of the Auxiliary Service Act, which was a question of tremendous debate, Article 9 said that there should be arbitration boards of capital and labor and government that should be established in case there are disputes over whether workers are being kept under duress in their plants and really want to leave and go elsewhere. And then those arbitration boards were given certain discretionary powers really to adjudicate even certain kinds of wage disputes. In other words, you institutionalize the union within a bargaining framework, and that, to the reformist trade unionists and socialists, was considered to be a tremendous victory, and that was it. And for that, the board free was entered into. Now, the cost is immense. The cost is prohibited from the point of view of anything that resembles a socialist ideology. Because the cost meant that the Social Democratic Party and the trade unions served as the most aggressive guardians of social peace. I tell you that throughout the war, these chiefs of the reformist wing of socialism and trade unionism were used constantly, over and again, to discourage workers from going on strike, to quell them when there was agitation. And finally, when there were explosions of one sort or another, really to collaborate with the government in order to quell those explosions. A very classic and well-documented case in June of 1916. Because in June of 1916, you did have an explosive strike in the city of Berlin. And the strike was not an economic strike. There were 55,000 workers out in the middle of the war when it was difficult to do that. And the strike was political because they were protesting the arrest and the sending to jail of Karl Liebknecht. And that strike spread uh, to Braunschweig, for example, and consequently became really something that was potentially a political combustible item. And so, quite obviously, the government sent in repressive forces, but had to find the origin or the sources of the strike. The source of the strike came with the so-called revolutionary shop stewards, the so-called Obleute, and noted well because they will become important in the whole German Revolution. 
And these Oblojta, or these revolutionary shop stewards, were not uh, simply trade unionists. Uh, they were a very special breed uh, within the workforce. Uh, they were a radical wing or a radical faction. And one of the most important of them, Richard Müller, was the man who really had instigated uh, this strike of June of 1916. The result was the government wanted to know, the police, the constabulary wanted to know who the authors of this were. Richard Müller, who was this revolutionary shop steward, always accused the Social Democrats of having fingered the ones who had really instigated the strike and really forcing them into the army or forcing them into prison. And that finally has been documented. Uh, because in the book of Peter von Erickson, which is an excellent book on the German Revolution of 1918, written a dozen years ago, he documents from the records uh, in the police files. Uh, the record, for example, of August Müller, who was a very right-wing social democrat and simply gave the name. You see them all. The point is that you're, the cost of this kind of collaboration is the cost of collaboration against the working class movement itself. But there's still yet another price. And the price is the banalization or the trivialization of what are the goals of the working class movement. What we're talking about is the banalization of them into a very black kind of economism. Uh, into the idea that consumerism, or simply getting a better way, really is the entire BL and the end all of the working class movement. Now you see old Penny Pop, the head of the building trades workers in France, went to the Loire Valley in the spring of 1917, and he wrote a piece that really sticks in my mind. And he said it is just terrible. These reformist trade unionists come to the workers and they tell them, we will bargain for you for better pay. Here they are in the midst of the war, and they think, oh, of pay, pay, pay. They will sell their ideals, sell their movements, sell their sisters, says Nelly Ka, for a better pay packet, and consequently, what does that do? What does that do to the consciousness of people? And in the final analysis, the real cost is in sensibility. The real cost is in the sensibility that comes, after all, from a revolutionary consciousness. It comes from that rupture of solidarity with people who suffer and struggle and who were dying. It's the kind of sensitivity, for example, that is best illustrated in a text of Rosa Luxemburg. And Rosa is talking in the Junius pamphlet about this war and what this war really means. And if you have the sensibility that comes from a certain kind of consciousness, then you write this and you don't worry, after all, about the small change of class collaboration. The show is over. The curtain has fallen on trains filled with reservists as they pull out amid the joyous cries of enthusiastic maidens. We no longer see their laughing faces smiling cheerily from the train windows upon a war bad population. Quietly they trot through the streets with their sacks upon their shoulders, and the public, with a fretful face, goes about its daily tasks. Into the disillusioned atmosphere of pale daylight there rings a different chorus, the hoarse croak of the hawks and hyenas of the battlefield. 10,000 tents guaranteed according to specifications, 100,000 kilos of bacon, cocoa powder, coffee substitute, cash on immediate delivery. Shrapnel, drills, ammunition bags, marriage bureaus for war widows, leather belts, war orders, only serious propositions considered. And the cannon fodder that was loaded upon the trains in August and September is running on the battlefields of Belgium and the Vosges, where profits are springing like weeds from the fields of the dead. Business is flourishing upon the ruins. Cities are turned into shambles. Whole countries into deserts. Villages into cemeteries, whole nations into beggars, churches into stables, popular rights, treaties, alliances, the holiest words and the highest authorities have been torn into scraps. Every sovereign by the grace of God is called a fool, an unfaithful wretch by his cousin on the other side. Every diplomat calls his colleague in the enemy country a desperate criminal. Each government looks upon the other as the evil genius of its people, worthy only of the contempt of the world. 
hunger revolts in Indonesia, in Lisbon, in Moscow, in Singapore. Pestilence in Russia. Misery and desperation is everywhere. Shame and dishonor, waiting in blood and dripping with silk. Thus, capitalist society stands. Not as we usually see it, playing the roles of peace and righteousness, a order of philosophy of ethics, but as a roaring beast as an orgy of anarchy, as a pestilential breath, devastating culture and humanity, so it appears in all its hideous nakedness. But you see, you have to have a sensibility to write that, or to think it, or to say it. And there is something quite astonishing. While the expansionists were about as repentant as they could be, while the Treaty of Brestman Post was as public as it could be, and to see what the expansionists really wanted, not to have said a word, not to have opposed the war its purposes, but to have bargained for those two laws. Oh yes, there was a third part to this collaboration. And it came, of course, in November of 1918. And that finishes off the story. Because it was, after all, the industrialists themselves who suddenly wanted to collaborate, and why not? The monarchy was finished, and the revolution was on the horizon, and then it was to their benefit to strike an agreement with the trade unions and say, yes, yes, we will play that game. But was it right for the trade unions at that time when there was a living and vibrant alternative to say, yes, yes, we will play that game too? And so it was in Dusseldorf on the 9th of October of 1918 that the big industrialists met and they chose who was Guinness to negotiate for them with the yet. And Guinness was, after all, an absolute powerhouse. It was the most important coal baron in the Ruhr, and also with terribly important interests in the electrical trade and in the steel trade. And as Hugo Stinnes went to Karl again, the leader of the trade unions, and as this German revolution is on the horizon and is maturating, as the king is finished, as the monarchy is finished, they strike the accord, the stinnes Legian Accord of the 12th of November of 1918, which guarantees the class collaboration between industry and labor precisely at that moment when it was the least of all possible evils for those particular industrialists, and it inscribed in that agreement the eight-hour day, it inscribed collective contracts, it inscribed workers' committees, to overseer those collective contracts. And yes, yes, the industrialists would no longer sponsor company unions or the so-called yellow unions. And so the trade unions immediately went into a capitalist republic because with that agreement, they laid the foundation for it. At that moment, the industrialists collaborated, but only then. And the class struggled. Well, Rose Luxemburg, again in the text, says that the class struggle is funny, that it doesn't go away. And you may, after all, collaborate. Well, the first thunder of crook cannons in Belgium welded Germany into a wonderland of class solidarity and social harmony. How is this miracle to be understood? The class struggle is not known to be a social democratic invention that can be arbitrarily set aside for a period of time when it may seem convenient to do so. The proletarian class struggle is older than the social democracy, is an elementary product of class society. It flamed up all over Europe when capitalism first came into power. The modern proletariat was not led by the social democracy into the class struggle. On the contrary, socialism was born out of the class struggle. No, no, it didn't go away, and it moved. And you see the point. The point is that all of this expansion of capitalism in the course of the First World War really enhanced the capacity on the part of the ruling class to resist any kind of revolutionary offset. And the class collaboration that went on in the hands of the working class organizations really did defy a revolutionary consciousness on the part of part of the working class. But then the war, the war did its own revolutionary work. And that revolutionary work was constantly to be mystified, to be mystified about what the nature of the society was. And so you begin to get a resistance. 
And the resistance begins in Europe. And it begins small. Take part. There never was anything smaller than the anti-war resistance in 1914. It begins with very isolated, scattered centers of resistance. And then the pacifism trickles and eddies through Europe. And then it begins to grow into a stream. And finally, it is a movement. And then the movement becomes very powerful. And by the time we are at the end of the war, the revolutionary option is a serious one posed in every war-torn society. And what are those initial centers of resistance? The Russian Social Democrats, of course. The Russian Social Democrats are breed apart, in a sense. All those Russian Social Democratic deputies in the Duma on the 8th of August, both the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks, unanimously voted against war appropriations. And there, there in exile in Switzerland, sat Lenin. And Lenin was really extraordinary about that war. And I want you to realize that the text I'm going to cite here is a text written on the 28th of August of 1914. Now note it parenthetically that to get a text of Lenin around in 1914 was not easy. Nobody could read it. First of all, it was in Russia. And secondly, you couldn't penetrate foreign frontiers. And there were all kinds of censors. You're talking about a statement for a very tiny circle of Bolsheviks, something that finally, after all, will come to European attention, but not for a long period of time, not for two bloody years. And here in this text, called The Tasks of Revolutionary Social Democracy in the European War, listen to this first paragraph. The European and World War has the clearly defined character of a bourgeois imperialist and dynastic war, a struggle for markets and for freedom to loot foreign countries, a striving to suppress the revolutionary movements of the proletariat and democracy in the individual countries, a desire to deceive, disunite, and slaughter the proletarians of all countries, by setting the wage slaves of one nation against those of another so as to benefit the bourgeoisie. Paragraph two, where is the great betrayal? The great betrayal is in the second international, and it is the betrayal of opportunism. Unlike Rosa Luxemburg, Lenin very quickly goes to the jugular, and he says that Kautsky is the same as the right wing, that it is an opportunism historically shot through that second international and its social democratic, uh, uh, its German social democratic leading party. And what is the tactic? The tactic is the extraordinary one of revolutionary defeatism. From the viewpoint of the working class and the toiling masses of all the peoples of Russia, the defeat of the Tsarist monarchy and its army, which oppresses Poland, the Ukraine, and many other peoples of Russia, and foment hatred among the people so as to increase great Russian oppression of other nationalities, would be the lesser evil by far. It is a call for peoples to rise up against the war, even at the risk of the defeat militarily of their country that that defeat is the lesser evil, such a strong formulation that nobody could really quite stomach it for quite a period of time. And so there is that center of Russian resistance. And there is the center of resistance in the neutral countries, in Switzerland, in Italy, in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, the representatives of the neutral countries come together at Lugano in Italy in, uh, in uh, September of 1914 and say the neutrals must work, after all, for a negotiated peace. And then, 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 to meet, to meet in full war the enemy, to have an international conference, to cross frontiers and meet the country you are fighting. And it's done on the 25th to the 27th of March of 1915. And 28 delegates come together in the city of Bern in Switzerland, and they are all women. And the women did the first international act of resistance in the First World War. And they are called by Clara Zetkin, the great militant of Germany. And she says that maybe we have more sense 
and maybe we have more guts, and maybe we will go across hidden and distant and forbidden frontiers, and maybe we will draw a common resolution, and French women will embrace German women, and Russian women will embrace Austrian women, and that they did at Bern in March of 1915. And they came from eight countries, and only one was a French woman, a poor thing, for Louise Sommineau, a seamstress who had never been to college and who had tremendous guts and who had founded two short life feminist movements that tried to combine her with socialism before the war and that Louise Sommineau, over forbidden frontiers, went and carried home the texts and that is the first real anti-war propaganda in France. She grinds them out by herself, circulates them in the underground, and then gets pulled off to jail. And so think about that. Think about it for a day, that that internationalism is a tremendous act, and think that it was the women who did it. And maybe there's something in that, and maybe that's where the revolution is. week of the war of 1914 that Lenin wrote the first of a series of articles which really took full measure of what had happened. And in that succession of propositions which were uncompromising and perfectly clear and which flew from that pen quite hot as though they were flint from a, a kind of a anvil, Lenin laid it out and argued the following case. In the first place, that the war was imperialism pure and simple, there was no other explanation for it. In the second place, that all of the apologetics, after all, that had been offered about national defense were only calculated mystification to blind the masses. And third, and very important, that in collaborating with the ruling classes, in rushing into the sacred union, the party of the trade union chiefs had dishonored the cause of socialism and in fact had betrayed it, and that that betrayal in the fourth place was simply the culmination or the capping of decades of opportunism. Opportunism when a kind of privileged strata of the working class movement, those party secretaries, those deputies, those journalists, those upper echelons of the bureaucracy had played the capitalist game and consequently had drained the working class organizations of any semblance of revolutionary practice. And finally, and most important, that the Second International, because it embodied, if you please, the opportunism of its member parties, was simply a rotting corpse. That it was dead, and it could never be restored. It was dead once and for all. And was that, in Lenin's view, a cause for gloom? But you don't understand, Lenin, that there is no cause for gloom. There are only tasks. And consequently, while militants across the belligerent countries of Europe were really reeling on the ropes of despair, thinking that there was nothing to be done, thinking that all was lost, what Lenin did was to say that the war was a great dividing point in the working class movement, that it was the point of departure for a new revolutionary struggle against imperialism at all of its works, a revolutionary struggle which, as the war progressed, would become deeper and finally shake the very foundations of the established order. And so it was that just at that time that the patriotic pusas of the masses were still echoing in the streets of the capitals of those belligerent countries, Lenin broke down what he considered to be the imprescriptible and the definable tasks that socialists, any socialists who were worth their soul and who could still call themselves that, really had to fulfill. That there were duties of the moment, and they were in the first place to form revolutionary cadre and to go into the underground if that was necessary. In the second place, to reach and touch the masses, to, uh, to make that kind of anti-imperialist propaganda which finally could demystify the mass to mount a kind of relentless struggle against all of that imperialism and all of that war effort, and finally, and the culmination of Lenin's thinking, really to cause that patriotic front to come crashing down under the blows of the class struggle. And was it all a fantasy? 
But Lenin said, no, that is the task of the moment. And so for a socialist, there could be no seduction by pacifism. And Lenin was perfectly clear about that, that all of the lucifrations about pacifism, that all of those proposals about a negotiated peace, which were certain to fill the air, and which would reach such a high point with a partisan like Woodrow Wilson, that those proposals in Lenin's mind, after all, were simply designed to restore the status quo pre bellum and to keep the ruling classes in their place, and was there any chance for socialists to bathe in the sentimentality about their old organization, no at Lenin? There can be no sentimentality about unity, about all of the blood, sweat, and tears that had gone into the building of those old organizations. Lenin said that revolutionaries cannot cohabit with reformists. And consequently, it was their obligation, whenever necessary, to divide and to split the old working class organizations, to regroup the working class into authentic Marxist parties, and consequently to lay the foundation, yes, the foundation for a new, a third, a revolutionary international, which would orchestrate the overthrow of capitalism, and had the man given lead to his senses. This, in the fourth week of the war of 1914, granted, after all, that there were anti-war militants in every belligerent country who simply had not succumbed to the wave of chauvinism and bitterly resented the chiefs of their parties who had drowned in that chauvinism, granted that there were such militants, but how many of them had ever heard of Lenin? And if they had heard of Lenin, how many had ever read a text of his? And if they had read those texts of September of 1914, how could they possibly have taken his prescription seriously? These were anti-war militants who were thoroughly disorganized in their countries, who were silenced in their own parties, who were straitjacketed by a kind of political repression on the one hand and patriotic propaganda on the other. They couldn't even find the masses, much less mobilize them for revolutionary action. Think, after all, of somebody like that brave French anarchist Sebastian Paul, who sat and ground out pacifist tracts in France in 1915 until the so-called moderate minister of the interior, Louis Malvi, called him to the ministry and said to him in no uncertain terms that any soldier caught with one of your pamphlets in his hand will be summarily shot. Or think of that very brave French woman, Louise Sommineau, Feminist, socialist, somebody who had spent so many years of her life before 1914 trying to organize women for socialism, who crossed illegally the Franco-Swiss border in March of 1915 to attend that international conference of socialist women that had been convoked by Clara Zetkin to do, if you please, some of the, what no man in the French socialist movement would dare to have done then to meet comrades from the enemy country right in the midst of the war and to embrace those comrades. And Somino brought back over that frontier the resolutions of that woman's conference, incendiary resolutions denouncing the war as imperialists and enjoining women to do anything by any means in order to bring that war to a halt. But what was she to do with those resolutions? Silenced in her own party, quarantined as though she were a bacillus, consequently forced to grind out those pamphlets herself, to leave them in metro stations and on park benches until the cops, tracking her every move, dragged her off to Saint-Lazare prison and kept her there, the prison reserved for prostitutes in Paris. No, no, but Lenin knew all of that, and he had not taken leave of his senses any more than Mao Zedong did in 1930 when he took those shattered legions of the French Communist Party and took them into the Kangxi Hills and said he proclaimed a revolutionary base. 
No, he was not, he had not taken leave of his senses any more than those partisans in the Second World War, who in 1941 or 42, against that incalculable force of Nazi power, said that they were taking to the hills in order to mount a resistance movement. Lenin knew that the Bolsheviks were isolated or relatively isolated in Europe. He knew that he had very few allies. He knew that the best he could do was to make certain beachheads through which he could begin to propagandize the masses. He found one such beachhead, an important one, in the left wing of the International Federation of Socialist Youth. The young socialists, much more vulnerable to the war, not implicated in reformist practice, and certainly bitter about the capitulation of August of 1914. And it was in April of 1915, just 10 days after the women had had their international conference in the city of Bern, that 16 representatives of the left wing of that international youth movement of socialists met in that same city of Bern, representing 10 countries to form a new revolutionary federation of socialist youth. And they chose as their secretary that Billy Munzenberg, who would be so very important in the whole history of the common term, who would become one of the very great and key figures in the revolutionary politics of the Third International. And that Billy Munzenberg was a young German worker who had been formed in that Berlin worker school in which Rosa Luxemburg had taught before the war, and who was now in Switzerland under the influence increasingly of the Bolsheviks. And so that new youth organization launched at Oregon called International Youth. And in that magazine, Lenin and the other Bolsheviks printed their articles. And that magazine had echoes throughout that anti-war underground in Europe, especially in Germany, and began to pick up young people for that revolutionary cause. But Lenin knew that a few beachheads do not make an international revolutionary movement. He knew, like any good revolutionary, that he had to wait and bide his time and crank out his propaganda because he was certain that the war would radicalize the masses, that gradually resistance movements would surface and then they would burgeon. And he put it very precisely at the beginning of 1915. We will have built the basis for a revolutionary international only when we have national movements willing and able to found independent Marxist parties. And those movements will emerge most decisively in Germany, the home of the oldest and most powerful working class organizations. And so you see Lenin had gone to the jugular, that the future was up for grabs, that the destiny of millions of working men and women hung in the balance, that everything could turn on the capacity of revolutionary socialists to break the stranglehold of those old reformist organizations, to build authentic revolutionary Marxist parties, and to catalyze that revolution from below, which would be strong enough and disciplined enough, finally to storm the fortress of monopoly capitalism. But you see, between that conception and the realization is a terrible field of struggle, is a ferocious field of struggle. And it is mined, after all, by state repression. And it is mined by tactical blunders. And it is mined by all kinds of ideological confusion. And not least of all, by that very sophisticated bobby trap, uh, by that best product of American industrial liberalism, mainly the Lucifrations of Woodrow Wilson, which surely would come uh, to mind that field of uh, struggle. But Lenin was right on the mark. It was in Germany that that anti war movement surfaced first and burgeoned first. And on that very day of August 4th of 1914, when the deputies, both centrist and rightist, had voted for war appropriations unanimously, the first seeds of an anti-war resistance began to sprout in Germany. Nor should that surprise us very much, because we remember, do we not, 
that literally scores of thousands of German workers had been out on the streets in July protesting against an impending war. And it stands to reason that not all of them were swept up by chauvinism once the war was declared. And we remember also that in certain localities of Germany, where the left wing had been in charge of the party organization or of the press, the city of Stuttgart, for example, where the party newspaper was in the hands of Arthur Christian, who would become such a great friend of the Spartacus in 1916 and 17, or in the working class suburb of Berlin, known as Peter Barnim, in those areas, not only was the war of but the vote of the deputies was opposed after it had been taken by almost unanimous support from left-wing militants in those particular districts. The important point is that there was a left wing in the German Social Democratic Party before the war, and that left wing remained, and that it stood head against the war. And it was a left wing which, even though it had been increasingly isolated as the war approached, even though the Congress of Jena in September of 1913 had been such a decisive victory for the right in the Social Democratic Party, that left emerged from Jena more organized and more pugnacious than ever. Consider that in December of 1913, Rosa Luxemburg and two of her very good comrades, her friend Franz Merrick, who was the great intellectual of the Social Democratic Party, certainly its greatest literary critic, certainly the biographer of Karl Marx, a man perfectly venerated in the party, with Merrick and with her friend Karski, who was of Polish origin and who had helped her to found the Polish Social Democratic Party, she launched a newspaper in December of 1913 called Social Democratic Correspondence, addressed to the elements of the left in order to give them coherence, to give them structure, to give them strength. The point is that left was there and it responded, yes, that very day of the 4th of August. And it is Rosa, who is not overwhelmed by the events, who faces them right in the eye. That night of the 4th of August, she gathered at her apartment, Rosa Luxemburg, six of her friends, seven of them to plan a strategy. It is worth to name those seven because they all become important in the Spartacist movement and ultimately in the foundation of the German Communist movement. And she is there with her friends Marin and Karski, who also goes by his own name of Marschleski. She is there with Wilhelm Pieck, who is a worker, a carpenter by origin, who becomes such an important organizer of the Spartacist movement, and who, when he dies, of course, will be the president of the Communist Republic of East Germany. And she is there with her friend Eberlein, who is going to be so important in turning Spartanism into the German Communist Party, himself a worker out of factory origins, and then her friends Hermann and Katie Doctor. The Doctor, they both of them intellectuals, Hermann Doctor, a teacher of philosophy, a party journalist, Katie Doctor, his wife, very much a militant at the side of Paro Zetkin in the International Federation of Socialist Women, and with them Ernst Meyer, that Ernst Meyer, who would be always at the side of Rosa in the building of that Spartacus movement, and they were there in her flock. And the problem was what to do, and what would you do, confronted with that kind of problem. And their answer, quite obviously, was to make contact with every element of the left that they knew opposed the war, and that opposed the vote of the 4th of August, the betrayal of the party. Secondly, and very crucially, to make their voice known internationally. In other words, to tell the comrades across the frontier of Germany that an opposition did exist. And then, of course, to reach the mass, somehow to get to the people and to propagandize them so that they were demystified of this uh, uh, patriotic uh, uh, gore of this patriotic propaganda. But, but, but the obstacles were terrific. Uh, the obstacles were terrific, first because of state repression. Uh, you remember that on the day of mobilization, Germany is under the law of siege. 
And by the law of siege, the army has really complete prerogative, uh, not only in economic and social matters, but in political matters. It can ban newspapers. Uh, it can bar political meetings, of uh, which it considers to be anti-war meetings. How do you get through uh, that kind of network of repression? But, but add to that uh, the party. Add to that the executive of the Social Democratic Party, uh, which plays hand in glove, just as the trade union executive does, which plays hand in glove with this repression. Uh, you understand that the quid pro quo in the uh, sacred union, uh, the quid pro quo in the board freedom, uh, was that the working class organizations would remain, but they would clean their houses, uh, that they would not permit opposition to the war to be known or to be articulated. And consequently, they played that game of interior policemen and played it very hard, stifled uh, the opposition that might have come from the left. And it was, of course, Karabina who learned that lesson very quickly. And Vizneff's lesson was, after all, crucial in the whole history, not only of this resistance in the First World War, but of the whole history of the revolutionary movement. Because when Vizneff, after all, discovered uh, that the party was simply not a place in which he could operate, it launched him on a kind of militant career during the war, which made him the very beacon light, the conscience of a revolutionary opposition to that war. Poor, poor Karl. Because you see, he had voted for war on the 4th of August of 1914 despite the fact that he had been a bitter opponent of militarism before the war, a bitter opponent of imperialism. And he had gone right up to the wire, the 3rd of August of 1914. You see, there had been a conference of that social democratic parliamentary deputation. They were taking a straw vote on what they would do the next day on the 4th of August. And in that straw vote, 78 voted for war credits and 14 against. There was an opposition of 14. They were people like Haza and like Leibour, and they said they would vote against war credits. They came the day of the vote, and everybody came did. And poor Liebknecht was isolated and didn't want to act alone and didn't want to break party unity at that point and still had the idea that the implication of the party within the sacred union would not be so horrendous uh, that it would not lose all of its critical faculty and all of its independence. He said, for example, which is so poignant, in a letter to a socialist militant that he wrote on the 18th of January of 1915, which was really mea culpa, and which said that I did wrong on the 4th of August, but explained it in this way. I couldn't imagine that the party was going to take in as it did. I have regretted my weakness on August 4th ever since. I should have shouted no, and I open to the most severe criticism for not having done so. But you see, Lignac thought still it was possible for the party to play an opposition role, really to criticize imperialism. And so what he asked in the very first week of the war was that the party call a conference in Berlin in order to attack any imperialistic schemes. Uh, that if this was a war for national defense, it ought not be a war for conquest, for the conquest of territory and markets. And the party said, you're out of your skull, and we're not having any conference, and just keep quiet. And Vignac began to realize that it was not the party he thought was, and consequently he started to speak out. And he went up to Stuttgart, a Karasek in Holy City, a city really in the left, in the spectrum of the Social Democratic Party. And he went up there on the 21st of September, invited, and he was to speak about imperialism. In other words, against the chauvinistic propaganda that was circulating around, that Germany should collect this territory or that territory as a result of a victory. And he spoke about that. But in the course of the debate, the militants in Stuttgart said to him, how in hell did you come, after all, to vote for war appropriations on the 4th of August? And he went through it, and he said, well, you see, on the 3rd, there really was an opposition of 14, and I thought that they were going to hold strong, and then they all came in. And when the party heard that Vietnam had revealed that, which they had kept secret, always the idea was that there was a common unanimous front. They said that he had broken the party discipline, was under interdiction for it, and could be expelled from the party for it. And so Vietnam learned his lesson. 
But you see the point. The point is that within that framework of repression, the only thing these left-wing militants, these opponents of the war could do, how to resist under those circumstances, was to become what the French later would call in the resistance movement, Fontilleur. In other words, to remain inside the organization, to use whatever platform might conceivably be available, but to go outside the party, to speak wherever you could speak, to write wherever you could write, to make your voice heard no matter what. And so it is uh, that in the first week of September of 1914, a letter appears in two Swiss newspapers, terribly important just in terms of the impact across the frontiers. And the letter is signed by Rosa Luxemburg, by Karl Liebknecht, by Clara Zetkin, and by Franz Mary. And they say that there is an opposition to the war in the Social Democratic Party, uh, that the views of Sudikum, the views of David, they are not the unanimous views of the party, an opposition exists. In other words, they make themselves known. But mainly, what they're constrained to do is to talk in all kinds of little meetings, generally semi-private meetings, so that they're not suppressed by the police. And Rosa Luxemburg is absolutely indefatigable. She writes a letter to her young friend, Kostya Zetkin, in September of 1914, in which she said, to remain silent at the present moment while waiting for our more propitious times would be both criminal and cowardly. In the past six days, I've addressed five meetings, working as best I can to some sort of organization of the opposition. She went just a month after the war began uh, to a Berlin suburb, the suburb of Newcomb. And in Newcomb, she gave four successive speeches on four successive nights, which apparently for those who heard them were a masterpiece. <laughs> because what she did was not only to attack what had gone on on the 4th of August, but to explain it, that it was a betrayal of every resolution, of every commitment that the party had made earlier, but more than that, that it was the culmination of all of that opportunism, all of that reformism, all of that parliamentarianism that had dug into the party and ceased to make it a revolutionary party, but simply a kind of pressure group of within German society. But you see, as the weeks went on, what happened to this left-wing opposition was that it grew more radical, and that is almost essential. It grew more radical in its theses, it grew more radical in its actions. At the beginning, mainly what it attacked was the betrayal of the fourth of August, about the party had not stuck to the commitments that it had by its various resolutions. But when you get to November and December of 1914, these left-wing revolutionaries are talking about the war itself. And they're talking about it as an imperialistic war, as a war that has no interest to the working class. And more than that, that is a war of interior repression. In other words, a war to snuff out the very arms that the, uh, that the working class movement has forged to snuff out their voice. And so you begin to get speeches of this kind. It's Hendy Doker in November of 1914 at a meeting of socialist women in Berlin who says the following. The present world war isn't accidental. It isn't the result of this or that leader's machinations. It is the product of a global capitalist competition for profit, for markets at any cost. Its origins are embedded in the contradictions of the system. And there is Clara Zetkin. And Clara Zetkin writes her famous appeal to uh, women international, her famous international appeal to socialist women. She writes that in November of 1914, and that's the call to that meeting that will ultimately be held in Bern in uh, March of 1915. Now, the origin of that appeal is extremely interesting, parenthetically, uh, because the idea came from Bolshevik women. Uh, the idea came from the Bolshevik women's newspaper uh, being published in uh, Switzerland at the time, and in which Krupskaya, who was Lenin's wife, and Vanessa Armand, who was his girlfriend, both of them were writing, and consequently, in that paper, there was a call, and a very vigorous one, for some kind of revolutionary action by women, and Karazakin responded. She wrote this appeal, tried to print it in her own magazine, which was a magazine called Gleichheit, and that was censored. And so she had to print it in a Swiss newspaper, and then make a clandestine track out of it, and in that track of Karazakin's we read, the longer the war lasts, 
the more those high-sounding phrases, which the ruling class mouths to conceal its aggressive purposes, are revealed to be flimsy lies. Uh, the mask is falling, and there, in all of its hideousness, is the war for capitalist conquest, the ruling class urge to conquer the world. And Lutnap goes one step further, because he says not only that it is an imperialist war, but that it is interior imperialism and underscore it. Because the knowledge of that is really a revolutionary idea. It's the idea that what you are struggling for is systematically being destroyed. In other words, the implication of it is that you really have to reanimate or rekindle the class struggle, that you have to fight against your interior enemy and not against the enemy across the frontier. Because Beatnet says in a speech of November 10th of 1914, we're not supposed to talk about the class struggle anymore. But have the profound contradictions of society disappeared? Of course not. And the sacred union is nothing but a strategy to conceal that fact and to repress every manifestation of struggle. The proletariat has been disarmed in the name of the party troops, but under the same banner, political terror and economic exploitation have progressed to new heights. What does the Kaiser's posture mean that there are no parties in war? Only a single United Nation. Only that every worker has earned the equal right to die for capitalist profits. And as these species grew more radical, quite obviously, the organization or the action of these left-wing militants also became more radical, moved toward the subversive. After all, they were blocked out of the party press. They didn't have any forums. And consequently, they began to go to the underground uh, to make weekly newsletters that were thinking Graph, for example, out in Nieder Barna, among their, uh, their comrades in that working class suburb, or mimeograph by the Federation of Socialist Women, and they would circulate these until finally they began, toward the end of 1914, to build up an underground network, an underground network of compacts. And it is eight or nine who was very much responsible for that network, who described how it worked in a text that he wrote some ten years later. In each locality of any importance, we found one reliable comrade capable of clandestine work who kept in constant touch with us, who received our propaganda and our literature, and then who organized a group of local comrades to circulate our tracts and papers. By the middle of 1915, our network covered more than 300 towns and cities in Germany. Well, what did all that add up to? Did it mean that they were after a schism? Did it mean that they were out, after all, to break the Social Democratic Party and to found what Lenin said was crucial, namely a new revolutionary party that could do the work, after all, that the SPD could no longer do? Now, that surely was the view of the right-wing leaders of the Social Democratic Party. They wanted to get rid of these people anyway. They wanted to provoke a schism because these left-wingers, after all, simply wouldn't play that game of corporatism. We're saying that that was not the way socialism ought to come. But even the centrists, the people like Haza and Haikowski, really began to accuse the Rosa group, as they called it, began to accuse them of wanting to split the party because, you see, these centrists were very much on the spot with all of this kind of attack, all this kind of propaganda against the imperialist nature of the war. They professed to be Marxists, and they were supporting the war. And consequently, you get this astonishing letter that Kautsky writes to Victor Adler in November of 1914, and I tell you, that the bill of the correspondence of Kautsky, which is immense, this one does him less justice than anything else. Because Kautsky writes to Victor Adler in November of 1914, Rosa is feverishly trying to split the party. She prefers to be first in the village rather than second in Rome. If she can't rule the big party, she wants a small one which swears by her. Now, you know, that's not very gracious. And it's not very gracious when you consider that Rosa Luxemburg was not only quite 
Bashir the Khan, but also was under state interdiction, had already been convicted of treason for a speech he had made in September of 1913, urging German workers not to shoot French workers down, and was going to go to jail on the 10th of February of 1915. Not a very gracious or comradely thing to, to have done. But worse than that, dead wrong. Because if there is any blind spot in the strategic horizon of Rosa Luxemburg, it is precisely her very deep-seated reluctance to pose the organizational question. If anything, she was anti-Sism. She was, uh, she was uh, almost viscerally opposed to any kind of split in a party, and the explanations for that are not only important, but extremely consequential. In part, it's a psychological thing. And you've got to remember, what building a party means to people who have put their lives into it. For people like Rosa Luxemburg, like Mehring, like Diefneck, to leave the party was to leave home. They had devoted their entire lives to it. I've known French communists like that. Uh, a great comrade whom I have, Madeleine Lebelieu, who spent 25 years in the party, most of the time detesting its leadership, thinking it was selling out at every turn, couldn't leave. Say la grande famille, she kept saying. It's my family, and I can't do it. Finally, they booted her out, and that resolved the problem. She had a nervous breakdown. But it suffices to say that that is a very deep kind of psychological reason. But it's much more of Rosa Luxemburg and much more important. It has to do with two very important strategic principles. One is, quite obviously, a, a kind of horror of sectarianism, or a horror of the sect. The idea of being cut off from the masses. Her notion is that the Social Democratic Party represents the organized working class mass, which is true. And to go into something small, to go into a sect, to be cut off, is never to have an opportunity to talk to the mass, uh, to enlighten them, uh, to uh, radicalize their consciousness, uh, to catalyze their action. All of that is inadmissible to her. Uh, she said to her friend Roland Pohl, who was a Dutch militant in 1908, when Roland Pohl wanted to leave the Dutch Socialist Party because it was so reformist that she said in a letter, but any working class party, no matter how bad, is better than the purest sect. And that's linked to the second principle, which is that very mere mystical faith that Rosa Luxemburg has the last, because it is her view that if the left can only get to that mass, if they can only clarify their thinking, the mass will act, and consequently, it will redress the balance in the party. It will oust those reformist leaders. It will restore the party unto its revolutionary integrity. She so hated that leadership of the party that she hated totally, you see, to distort that kind of party mass equation. And consequently, throughout the war, at crucial moments, Rosa Luxemburg and her group really resisted that notion of schism. But, futilely, because schism was a reality even before it was a fact. It is a reality psychologically. You can't imagine what it is, or maybe you can't, if you were in Portugal today, and you saw a real insurgent on the left, and asked him what he thought about Suarez and the Portuguese socialists, then you could imagine it. That the war really cut that chasm between reformists and revolutionaries, between those who supported the war and those who didn't, between those who toady or those who on the other side were called unrealistic, cut that chasm so deep that it could be filled only with hatred. Listen, in 1916, in July, Right after Karl Liebknecht had been hailed off to prison, David, one of those right-wing revisionists in the Social Democratic Party, said it was no great loss because he was only a braying, yapping dog. And so Rosa Luxemburg wrote a tract which became a Spartacus handbill in July of 1916 called The Question of Dogs, in which she wrote this. A dog is someone who licks the boots of his master for serving him out kicks for many years. A dog is someone who gaily wags his tail in the muzzle of martial law and faithfully gazes up to his masters, the military dictators, quietly whining for mercy. 
Dogs are and always will be the Davids, the Sudikums, and the Scheidemans. And they'll get their well-earned kick from the German working classes when the day of reckoning comes. Well, you see the hatred. The schism at that level is already there. But it's something more. It is that these left-wingers, after all, if they're to break out of those small circles of, of influence, if they're really to reach a public, are obviously going to have to break discipline. They're going to have to do things which will get the executive finally to boot them out of the party. And that becomes almost imperative toward the end of 1914. And consequently, the spotlight really shifts to Karl Liebknecht. Because it's Liebknecht who makes the initiative. You see, he has what Rosa Luxemburg doesn't have. He has a forum. He is a deputy in the Prussian Montage. And he is a deputy in the German Reichstag. And consequently, he has a place to talk. Rosa is getting muzzled. And the spotlight moves to Karl. And he is a child of the party. His father, Wilhelm Leitnacht, had been one of the two founders of that party. And he grew up in it, and Babel, after the death of the elder Liebknecht, had said, this is my adopted son. But the party tolerated Karl Liebknecht before 1914. They thought he was cuckoo. They thought he was unbalanced. They thought he was an utter romantic and war. Ranting and raving always about militarism. Writing a book that got him thrown into prison against militarism in 1907. Going into the Reichstag and into the Landtag and, brain, and ranting and raving about imperialism and militarism. And then really ruffling the waters. In 1913, when the party is coming close to the ruling class, making its accommodations, here is this young Liebknecht with that smile, that eternal smile on his face, exposing the bribery of Krupp to uh, deputies in the Reichstag in order to influence the military budget. Now there's something crazy about Liebknecht. <laughs> And even as a lawyer, because that was his profession, always a tumbler, always going after all and, and defending those who were oppressed, and then berating the authorities, berating them in public, too much of a noisy one, too unbalanced. And then you see this guy who was dragged out on the 15th of January of 1919 from a hotel and dragged to the tear garden and shot six times and killed this guy to the enemies of the working class, always considered to be a barbarian, obviously the incarnation of the devil, of the enemy of Christian civilization, yes. The same Nicknet, for example, who used to cite at great length Euripides in Greek, and cited Horace in Latin, and knew Shakespeare and Blake and Milton perfectly well, and knew the great Russian authors, yes, yes this great enemy of civilization. Well, the thing about Dietrich is he isn't like the others. And he isn't like the others for a variety of reasons. Trotsky caught him well in Trotsky's autobiography. He said, you see, he is half stranger in that social democratic party. By which he meant that there was nothing bureaucratic about Karl Wittner, that there was a sense of direction and of direct contact with the mass, never to be cut off from people, never to be cut off from the disinherited. And there was something else. There was that tremendous sense of international camaraderie. It's very difficult to be international, and Karl Wittner really was. And it is Koban Kai, moving well before the war, who captures that perfectly well. She says, Liebknecht embodied that authentic international spirit of camaraderie which you found so rarely among the leaders of the Second International. So that when, for example, Daniel de Leon asked Liebknecht at a Congress in Copenhagen in 1910 to come to the United States and make speeches on behalf of the Socialist Labour Party, Liebknecht came and made 12 speeches in America with his very bad English in order to help the comrades on this side of the ocean and militancy. There's not a great theorician in Karl Liebknecht, and certainly not a great writer. A tremendous orator, a tremendous man of action, someone really who, for whom action was the very lifeblood of that kind of militant life. And Radek captures him very well. Radek knew him extremely well before the war. And Radek writes this about him. An agitator in the fright, an explosive political energy, a volcanic spirit, full of life and joy, a man who knew how to struggle and to love, how he loved life, 
how he seized it by the neck. Now the shred of Philistine is up. Now the bit of hypocrisy. And underneath it all, a gentleness, a kindness that can't be described. You know, there's something marvelous about that. Because Rosa Luxemburg, who had a hard time with Deep Net for a while, she said he was a dirt and couldn't capture him. Always got to go to a meeting. She liked to sit occasionally and discuss it. Sue Lafon really discussed the question. Deep Net on the run all the time. Her description of him is marvelous in that particular respect. In a letter to Hans Dietrich. You know how Carl is. His life is an endless round of action. Meetings, commissions, discussions, speeches, in haste, in hurry, everlastingly jumping from the metro into the tram, from the tram into a car. Every pocket bulging with notebooks and appointment cash. His arms full of all the latest newspapers which you'll never have time to read. And yet always, always with a kind and cheerful smile on his face. And you think of that assassination in January of 1919, and you also think of that Carl Diefneff who ingratiated himself to Rosa Luxemburg by the fact that she discovered that he knew as much about flowers and birds as she did, uh, who wrote to his wife from prison in 1917, the history of music which you have sent me is marvelous. It will help me persuade Rosa that she has not properly credited the originality of Schubert. That is, in the hours of a return, when we can devote ourselves to art. And so it came to November and December of 1914, and Leibniz decided it was time to do the dramatic. Uh, there was a vote coming up for more appropriations again in December of 1914. He gathered in November all of those other 13 who had voted in that straw vote against war appropriations. He said, let's take our stand. He couldn't persuade them. He went then on the 2nd of December of 1914, an historic date in the history of anti-war resistance in the First World War. He went to the Reichstag, was not given the tribute to make a speech against the war, but when the vote came, he stood and shouted that word, no. And Robert, who was in the gallery, said, from on high in the galleries, I could see and feel the shock effect when he stood alone to hurl that defiance against the whole imperialist world, and that no vote was heard. If you know that great novel of Henri Barbus Le Feu, Under Fire, and he tells us which was true, that in the trenches on both the German and the French sides, the name Vietnam became almost a household word by 1915 and 16, the one who had said no in the Reich job. And of course that broke party discipline and consequently the party began to threaten the expulsion of Karl Vietnam. And so, in order to strengthen his case, he went to meeting after meeting and deepened his criticism. And he went to a Berlin suburb, the suburb of Neukog, in the middle of January of 1915. And there he said something rather remarkable about the sacred union. He said that the sacred union will never preserve the interests of the working class, but only suppress them. Whoever doesn't understand that we can use this war to fight for our own ends only by struggling against the ruling classes and not by marrying them in the sacred union hasn't understood the ABC of historical dialectics where the leadership of the SPD didn't care about the ABC of historical dialectics and consequently they brought Karl Liefneff up before the executive committee on the 2nd of February, censured him, told him he would be brought up for expulsion before the national conference to be held later in the year. Uh, the authorities helped the SPD leadership. On the 7th of February, though Dietneff was 47 years old, he was drafted. Now, since he was a parliamentary deputy, he was given leave to perform his parliamentary functions, but told he was a soldier, he could not take any stand in writing or in speech against the war, and he could not attend any political meeting except the meetings in the Reichstag themselves. And then he had the climax three days later, on the 10th of February, Rosa Luxemburg was suddenly apprehended and put in prison. Uh, she, her appeal had fallen through some three months earlier, but at that moment, it seemed propitious. But you see, these were revolutionaries in the trial, Luxemburg and Pinkneck. And they took that oppression and they made capital out of it. 
feet that went to the Prussian top top after Rosa had been arrested. And he said, what is your party truce? It is not a truce in terms really of your oppressing leaders of the working class. And he began to use that tribute as his window <coughs> on the world. Suppressed after all in other meetings, he would speak out in the Reichstag and in the Landtag. As far as Rosa is concerned, she said, all right, I'm going to prison. Before I go to prison, our left-wing group must have a magazine. We must have a magazine that has a theoretical strength and that tells us really what our strategy is. And consequently, she organized the launching of the Internationale, the International, which was which appeared on the 14th of April of 1915 as the organ of this leg. And she prepared the lead article for that first number of the 14th of August. And her article was on the necessity of burning the rot out of these parties, burning the rot out of the Second International. So she wrote in that article for that issue of the Internationale, under faith in all day or meet men, either imperialism or socialism as Marx understood it. The International will not be survived by bringing out the old grinds after the war. Only through a cruel and thorough mockery of our own half-heartedness and weaknesses, of our own moral collapse, can the recreation of the international begin. And the first step in this direction is to stop the war at once. But you see, even though Rosa is calling for a new international, she's still ambiguous. Does that mean a new party? Does that mean splitting the old party? Well, it never really gets clarified. The internationale is, of course, suppressed by the censors. It reaches only one issue. But Liebknecht clarifies it a bit in May. He writes the brochure with a very famous slogan, noted well, because the slogan is out. Liebknecht writes a brochure in which he says, the principal enemy is at home. Now, know what that means. If the principal enemy is at home, why the hell are you fighting the one across the frontier? And why have you not turned against that enemy at home? And so Liebknecht writes in that brochure, the principal enemy of the German people is in Germany. It is German imperialism, the German ruling classes. And we say nothing for those ruling classes, everything for the masses. Let us mobilize for action. Well, the state mobilized also. And it began to round up militants. And in July, it's Carl Zetkin who goes to prison. In September, it is uh, Pete, and it is Eberlein, and it is Meyer who are sent to prison. In October, it is Hermann Dunker who is drafted. In other words, they begin to denude the top leadership of this left-wing revolutionary movement and to no avail. Because, you see, the outreach had become greater. And in this sense, Lenin was right. As the war dragged into its second year, then the illusions about the war began to fall. And consequently, you get this inflation, you get these staggering shortages, and the patriotic front begins to crack and collapse under that pressure. And you begin to get spontaneous movements of protest. Women, over a thousand of them, protesting on the 28th of May in front of the Prussian city, uh, in front of the Berlin City Hall in 1915, shouting bread and peace. And then in Stuttgart and in Leipzig in November of 1915, more meetings by women and street protests broken up by police against that inflation than you see what happens. What happens is that this left begins to organize these street manifestations. It moves from propaganda to to direct action on the street. And you get it, after all, in the uh, in Berlin in uh, December of 1915, again in January, meetings organized by the tracks of this particular left. They're moving toward that revolutionary strategy. <coughs> and yet Lenin looks at it, and he says there is a danger in it, and that it is insufficient. Lenin took time out in July of 1916 to write a long critique of the German left. And he read the tract that Rosa had written in prison called the Junius brochure, or the Junius pamphlet of the crisis of social democracy. He read from the literature of this left. And he says it is fine. They attack the imperialist groups of the war. They certainly attack all of the betrayal of the 4th of August of 1914. But, two deficiencies. They do not single out the center 
for a very special attack. They don't single out those Kautskyites, those centrists, and Lenin begins to see something. He says, you see, the center will begin to detach itself from the war effort. It will begin to map a pacifist campaign for some kind of a negotiated peace, and it will begin, after all, to mystify the masses again. Important for the left to say these are no different than the others. They are just as implicated in reformism. Important, in other words, to demystify liberalism. And secondly, not clear, says Lenin, on the question of schism, on the question really of building a new revolutionary party. And you see, Lenin was a thousand times right. Because as the left opposition is growing, a centrist opposition develops. And it develops in the Reichstag among those center deputies like Haas and like Redebach and outside like Kautsky who begin to feel increasingly under the pressure of mass disaffection with the war. And so, on the 29th of December of 1915, 20 of those centrist deputies vote against war appropriations and already raise the possibility of a peace movement inside the socialist party itself, but a peace movement that is very realistic, that really wants a negotiated and not a revolutionary peace.